Um, so I, I think this chart of growth, this is my favorite. There's a lot of ways to measure the growth of Julia. Um, and they're all sort of fuzzy. Like we can't, it's an open source project. We can't really tell exactly how many people are using the project. Um, but I think stack overflow questions really are an indicator of like, this is normal users using this project in real everyday situations and they have questions. Um, and I mean, this is clearly something resembling exponential growth. There's a real hockey stick there. Um, apparently the hockey stick was like January 2014. I had no idea at the time. But what I do know is that now there's, you know, half a dozen stack overflow questions on a given day. Um, so, you know, given this huge amount of growth, I think it's increasingly urgent and important to everybody in this room, everybody in the world using Julia, uh, that we have a stable foundation for people to program against and to build their applications and build their libraries against. Um, at the same time, we're counterbalancing that with we don't want to bake in a lot of mistakes. So we, we, need, to, we need to get to 1.0, but we need to get there just fast enough and not too fast and not too slow. So. This talk is about what, what we feel like we really need to do at this point. Um, so there's going to be four areas I'm going to talk about. Core language, optimizations, standard library, ecosystem, and tooling. Um, these are actually not entirely well-defined. Like, there's a little bit of fuzz between these categories. So we can, we can you know, but debate about like, which category things should go into. But sort of still the whole collection stands, I think. Um, so the first thing about the core language that I think we need to address and that Jeff has spent a huge amount of time thinking and talking um, uh, about is the you know, type system overhaul. So the things there are include like a new subtyping algorithm, a new way of figuring out whether one of these complicated types that you, know, you saw in Tim's talk um, is actually a subtype of another. Uh, and then that includes the ability to do something that we've wanted to do for a while, but which is quite complicated to do, triangular dispatch. Um, so in Julia, you have this notion of diagonal dispatch where you, you call a method only if, you know, you, you have sort of, you know, you have a type parameter t, and then you have, you know, something is of type t, and then something else is also of type t. Uh, it's called diagonal because if you imagine the types of the arguments as a, as a table, columns and rows, the elements where the method actually gets called are the ones down the diagonal. So sometimes what you want to do is you want to specify one type parameter and then say, OK, well, I don't want the other type parameter to be exactly equal to that, so I can't use the same name. I want it to somehow be related to it in a subtyping fashion. Um, and so what that gives you is it gives you, you know, above, above the diagonal on the type table. So that's why that's called triangular dispatch. So that's, that's a useful feature for a lot of library writers, uh, I think particularly in the Ray code. Um, one of the things that will fall out of this is, is the ability you know, to actually just leave out the type parameter part um, and talk about, for example, so we can talk about matrix um, of something and it's, you know, it's array of two, two things and that's actually a way of a shorthand for saying, well, I don't care about the first type parameter, but I do care about the second parameter, I want it to be two. So we could just write that as that, but there's no, other than the matrix type alias, there's no way to actually write that in the language now. And for example, we don't have a way of talking about three tensors without also talking about the element type. You'd have to make a, make a type alias for that. But you could actually then have syntax for it with you know, this sort of like uh, array and then angle colon number. So this would be a way of saying an array that is two-dimensional and whose element type is number. Um, I think that'll, that'll clean up some code. Um, arrays. So a huge amount of work has gone into arrays. Um, I think one of the most important things that has come to pass over the 0 0.5 release cycle um, is that this, this API, these sorts of APIs that Matt Bauman worked out, that Tim is, is, is working on, um, have become pretty clear. They're not 100% clear yet, but I mean, the amount of clarity between where we were a year ago and where we are now is, is it's, it's a stark difference. Um, so now I think we're at, the t at a point where one of the things we might want to consider is, and, and this actually comes up for a number of reasons, separating out the storage type of the array from the actual implementation and then allowing the implementation of array, instead of being this thing that's baked into the C, C code, 
to be something that's just written in Julia. Just uses tuples and uses a reference to like a buffer type that has not really much to it. It's just, you know, the minimum amount of stuff to refer to some memory. Um, this is actually how Lua, uh, the Torch project, does this. And I, I sat down and talked with Jan LeCun was is at NYU and also at Facebook, of course. He's the head of their AI group. And he was gracious enough to sit down and talk with me about this. And he was very, very adamant that this was the right model and that they had tried other things and it was it didn't didn't work as well. Um, so I think that's probably the direction we're gonna go. Uh, we need to settle some, you know, concatenation, construction syntax stuff. We're actually now, in, you know, we, f we finally have a way of writing that I want a typed array and I just want it to contain this set of things, which you would think would be like the first thing you would have. We didn't have that until 0.5. Um, uh, one of the big, like, longest debates that just never really went, never really got entirely completely finished was whether slices of arrays should be views or not. Um, and the idea behind that was currently they make a copy. So if you slice an array, you get a copy by default. Um, sometimes that's a performance problem because obviously that's a huge amount of allocation, a lot of copying of data. Um, it would seem like it would be much more efficient to always just make a lazy copy and refer to the original array. Of course, that changes the semantics of things very drastically and could potentially silently break a lot of code. So this is not something you want to do lightly. You want to have a real, real performance gain if you're going to do that. Uh, and what came to pass when we finally got around to stop yammering and actually do some, some benchmarking was that it's unclear whether it's actually a performance gain. Um, it's a wash right now. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But one of the things that we don't know at the moment is what's going to happen if we can do particular optimizations that make creating a view much cheaper. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second in the optimization section. Uh, it, it is actually what, what Tim referred to um, in his talk about being able to stack allocate a thing that refers to the heap. That's the optimization that's required there. So it's possible that once we have that optimization, which we plan on doing, um, we'll revisit the view issue and be like, oh, wow, the views are so much faster than making a copy. It would be ridiculous not to have this be the default. But until we know that or don't know that, it, it's, you know, it would be a bad idea to go break everybody's code potentially without actually having a payoff. So until we're sure about whether there's payoff or not, we're not going to make that decision. Um, an another possibility is we could introduce, um, you know, when you do A and then you index into it, we could also do A at index. The, some people don't like that because they think it's sort of, I don't know, icky syntax, a little bit of like ASCII salad, but, um, you know, it wouldn't break everybody's code and it's only one extra character and you then you get the performance when you need it and, you know, so it's, that's a possibility. Um, Linear algebra changes. This was actually one of the areas in point five that we didn't make as much progress as I had hoped. Um, there's the infamous 4774 taking vector transposes seriously, uh, which I kind of feel like we could, should close like by all rights because we've taken them very seriously at this point. <laughs> um, Conjugate transpose is a little bit, it's got weird fallbacks. We need to do something about that. Uh, there's all these, there's sort of this hack where we, we lower, if you have A times B transpose or something like that, we lower that to A mul B T uh, as a function call and then you can define that and then we call the appropriate LA pack thing or we have a, a, a fallback that does, computes that without actually doing the transpose because it's expensive. That is just a horrible hack. Um, we just did it because, you know, you needed to do something. You can't have this, like, horrible performance uh, hole. Um, it would be much better to have some sort of lazy transpose type and use dispatch to do that in a, in a clean way. Um, so that, that'll probably happen as well. Um, I, I think there's actually an open pull request for that, and it just needs review and needs to actually happen, but somehow it didn't, didn't get done. Um, strings. I've done a bunch of work on strings. Um, the basic issue here is that we want to move all of the complexity of properly dealing with Unicode and Unicode strings and other types of strings into a package because it, it's too much complexity for the core language and most people don't actually need it. Um, again, this is another thing where we may re re we want a buffer type. So currently, or Julia strings are kind of a beast. Um, 
And the, the issue is that it, the data for a string is an array, and arrays are this complicated data structure that support multiple dimensions. And even in the one-dimensional case, because they're this general data structure, we pay for some of that. Um, so you have a string object. So you have this array object, and the array has a bunch of overhead not in, in addition to the data. And then you have a string that is another object, which you also have to allocate, which then refers to the string object. Um, so you know, you, by the time you get around to it, if you want to represent an empty string, it's like 72 bytes of data for an empty string, which is insane. Um, if we had a buffer type, that would be you know, only a few, like a word of overhead for the buffer type. And then with the optimization, where we can stack allocate uh, objects that refer to the heap, then you can avoid the actual allocation of any string object at all, and then really avoid all of that overhead. So that's, that's where we're going with that. Um, it's a fair amount of work, but it's definitely going to happen. Um, I, I think the thing, so it's very important if you're dealing with Unicode and transcoding between different encodings to, to check them and make sure that you, you, know, you throw errors for invalid data and that everything is kosher. Um, but the basic string type in Julia should really just be a data buffer that happens to have string-like behavior, um, which means it'll be essentially UTF-8-like behavior by default and that that's just sort of what you get. Um, in particular, you should be able to write a simple cat program where you just read in a bunch of data and then line by line and print it out. And that should always work and never throw errors. That requires, you know, you have to have some way of actually dealing with the fact that uh, you might have to represent as a character an invalid bit of data, but I, I have an idea for that which seems to work reasonably well. Um, and is bizarrely undisruptive. Like I changed it and there were like three things that needed to change in base. Um, so the full Unicode code support goes into packages. Um, there's the printf insanity, which if anybody has looked at our printf implementation, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's a, there's a story behind it. There was this PyPy um, blog post that said that they got 2x performance of C by specializing on the format string. So I was like, oh, that's great. We can do that too. Uh, spent a month implementing it and then couldn't do better than C. And then at some point I started poking into what they were doing and I realized that the re what they were actually specializing was specializing on the fact that they were printing the same integer twice. <laughs> So it wasn't the format, it was the value that they were specializing on. Um, so of course it was twice as fast because it, it, they're no, so, and the long story short, long story short, almost all of the work in printing is decoding the integer to decimal, which if you only do it once for each integer is gonna be much faster. The printing itself is actually not terribly difficult. So th that's why everything's insane and I just need to fix it. Um, and there's a, it's very likely printf will not be a macro and the code will be much better. Um, okay, so modularity. We've got some issues here. What we have now is pretty usable. Um, I think we need rel some support for relative using so that we can well, allow structuring code in packages in a way that doesn't require using include all the time. Um, there's an issue for that, 4600. Um, we just need to you know, make some decisions, have a discussion, make some decisions, and then implement it. Um, the, the, the code to implement this has actually kind of gotten kind of gnarly and the, for entirely different reasons, like the parallel, parallel loading of code, we, we need to actually work on that as well. Um, we might get rid of import, merge it into using. Um, there's this issue of conditional modules. So the issue here is that sometimes you, you have a module that wants to, so for example, like let's say uh, uh, Gadfly, for example, it has got a lot of support for data frames. But you could, in theory, render Gadfly without data frames. You know, it's totally usable without a data frame. You just have normal data. Um, but as it is, you end up having, Gadfly has to depend on data frames. And so, you know, you have this enormous graph of stuff that it depends on because it supports so many things. What would be nice is if you could have that be an optional dependency so that if you have da da data frames loaded, Gadfly can use, can interact with data frames, but if it's not loaded, then you don't need it. Um, 
a couple mechanisms for this have been proposed. One of them was having sort of these snippets of conditional code that only gets loaded if, you know, triggered it when, when data frames is loaded or is automatically run when, you know, if data frames is already loaded when you load Gadfly. Um, another idea that came up at some point that's lighter weight, but we haven't gotten around to implementing it, may, may or may not be the way we end up doing it, is the idea of having an extern where you can just sort of specify the part of the interface you actually depend on. Um, so that, that'll definitely be, ha be happening. Something, we need something along those lines. Um, there's a subtle issue of package and module name conflicts. So the idea here is that, so let's say you're, you, know, you have your own set of libraries, you stick them in load path, um, and you have your you know, you know, package like great.jl. It just implements all the best things. Um, and then someone else comes along, and it's, it's not even something you're directly using, but someone else publishes a package called great.jl. Okay, well, we search load path before we look at packages, so, so far you're okay. That's not a problem. But then, let's say one of the packages you are depending on decides to use great.jl, because it's great, like yours, but different. Well, both great. Um, they probably should have better names. Uh, <laughs> But now the problem is that when that package is loaded and it loads great.jl, it gets your great.jl instead of the one that it was supposed to get, which is a public package. So there needs to be some way of handling that. I don't know what it is, but we need to figure that out. I've actually seen this happen in the wild, so it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. Um, the, the current suggestion is rename your package, <laughs> which is kind of unfortunate, um, but you know, it works. Uh, so compiler-related stuff in the core language. Multi-threading, this is huge. A huge amount of work has been done on this. Um, it works. It's experimental still. It works. We need more work on getting the, you know, the, the runtime system to be fully thre thread safe and the libraries to be fully thread safe. Um, we also need to work on the, the, the way, the, the, way the programming model that you're going to use for actually expressing threading, which is not going to be anything like pthreads. Arch, Arch has talked about it a bit. Kieran has done a lot of work on it. Um, and uh, and Je Jeff and Jameson have done a huge amount of work on the actual internal stuff. Um, but that's, that's a high priority. That should, that's, and Yichao, that's right. I, I, once you start listening names, you're in trouble. Um, uh, static compilation, we also, we have a fair amount of ability to statically compile. You can, with the right, com you know, invocations of the Julia runtime, um, you know, even produce C code for your Julia program, uh, which is pretty amazing. It needs usability work. Um, we also want to have it make it incremental, so you don't have to just, like, build the world from scratch. You should be able to start from here and continue and then produce, you know, statically compiled code from that. Um, that will also make, incidentally, make package loading much faster. Um, and we want support for basically being able to write your program with a main function. So you define a bunch of stuff, you do all your thing, and then there's a main function. The main function is what actually starts the program. You should be able to compile that program uh, to, to you know, a binary which then runs, and what runs when you invoke the binary is the main, but the other stuff that you already ran up to, main, up to the definition of main is all completely compiled. Um, so I, I think that will that'll allow you to do things like write command line tools in Julia and run them reasonably. Um, so better nullable support. Um, it's been a lot of work on this, but there's you know, more, more support from the actual core language is needed. Uh, better error, error, error reporting and logging. Um, I mean, people encounter this all the time where you, know, you get an error and this is, this is actually, this is, one of the reasons we have a hard time with this, which I think people don't quite understand, is that this kind of thing, error reporting, is easy if you're in a completely dynamic interpreted language, because you're like in an interpreter and you just say, okay, well, where are we? You know, because you're in the interpreter. If you're in a compiled language, you, you know, you, runtime errors are less frequent and they're sort of not the thing you're trying to report. You're trying to re report compile time errors which you also know because it's at compile time. So we're in this weird hybrid world where we're, you know, we've compiled the code, but then we need to give you a runtime error that's really good, and that's just really, really difficult, and a huge amount of good work has been gone into that, but we obviously need more. Um, 
We need to finalize the AST and IR formats and APIs. If you don't know what that is, you don't care. But people who write macros and do sort of like deep, deep metaprogramming stuff in Julia and want to want to mess with our, our AST and IR, they they want some stability in that so it can't won't their code won't just break. Um, and then finally, the infamous 265, which is basically when you redefine a method or you know redefine part of a method or you know whatever overload something in some particular way, all code everywhere running should reflect that, whereas currently, if something was compiled and inlined in another function that was called, that will be cached and you won't see, you won't see the new definition reflected. Um, so that's, that's an important thing to fix. Uh, so these are things that are maybe 2.0. They would be really nice to have in 1.0, but we really need to know when to call it so that we can actually get to a release. Um, so record types, name tuples. This is basically what tuples are to positional arguments, named records or, or named tuples are to keyword arguments. Um, so they would improve the performance of keyword arguments, but they also could improve some of the things like uh, the compiler's ability to infer the types of things like data frame columns. So that would be really nice to have, but it might, might not happen for 1.0. It could be a, a 2.0 thing. Um, it could also happen in the 1.x timeline as an optimization and then only be exposed in the language as, as a 2.0 thing. So that's also possible. Uh, traits, you know, we, there's been a lot of work on this and we sort of, we use traits that are the, the so-called Tim Holy traits, um, which I, I do love the name. Um, uh, it, it works, it just is a way of leveraging the existing dispatch system, which I think is, is you know, it works pretty well. So the question is, you know, how do we add language features to, to make it a little more trans, like, not clear exactly that, you know, you're, you're adding an extra field and dispatching on it. Um, I, I think we may not need traits for 1.0 um, because we're getting by without it currently. Protocols and interfaces, I think it's really important to have this at some point, but I think, again, maybe not necessary for 1.0 because we're getting by without it. Um, Exceptions, currently our exception handling is a little bit like, okay, we just catch whatever. Um, th this makes me a little uneasy. I, I've proposed this chain of custody idea, which someone can look up if they care to read about it. Um, it's not universally popular. I think in particular, Jeff thinks it can't be implemented efficiently, um, which would be a showstopper. So we, we need something better, but it's unclear what. Um, okay, so optimizations. The core language part of this is like by far the longest. The rest of this is like uh, half of just the core language part. Um, so the highlights are this stack allocation of immutable objects with references to the heap. Very, very important. We must have this. This is like the most important optimization we need. Uh, also hard to do, but we're going to get this done. Um, uh, eliminate GC frames. I believe uh, Oscar has a pull request that already does this. Is Oscar here? No, no, he's still sleeping. Um, uh, so, and just, I mean, you always want faster GC, right? This is, this is always a thing that everyone wants. Um, vectorized code. So the, the, you know, F dot parens syntax actually helps a lot. And especially there's a proposal to, um, to, to, to syntactically fuse lots of those kinds of calls. So if you use that syntax to do a lot of vectorized operations in one line, the synth that would actually mean doing, you know, essentially creating an anonymous function and then applying it to all of the things in parallel, um, which is essentially syn syntactic level loop fusion. Um, but there's also situations where that's not gonna apply and we still want as optimizations better loop fusion um, just on the, on the code gen side. Um, Parallel Accelerator has got a lot of really great stuff in it. We would like to incorporate parts of that. Um, globals, I opened this make their performance less awful uh, issue. I think the, the pushback I got from Jeff was, well, maybe it's a feature that their performance is awful because you shouldn't be using them anyway. Uh, which, yeah, you know, okay, maybe. Um, or maybe we should make, I don't know. Um, Okay, standard library. Uh, so a lot of this is just you know figure out APIs and really finalize them, get them get them in good shape so that they really make sense. Um, 
collections. This is tricky. Um, there's a sort of weird, like, uh, you know, is a, is a dict really uh, just an, you know, iterable thing of, two, of pairs, or is it some other sort of data structure? Uh, and we, we really need to sort that out so all of that is coherent. I think we're, we're, we've, gotten, we've gotten close, um, but it needs another pass. Uh, IO APIs, there's a few weird, you know, like NB available sort of things hanging out that like probably should go away. Um, some, of the, some of the process or stuff around processes started out really nice and somehow, you know, we got a little lost, but we got much, much more functionality. So, but the a a API needs a little cleaning up. Um, unit testing infrastructure. Um, so Ian Dunning did great work with introducing the test set thing, but we're not actually using it internally for our own tests for the most part. We should transition to that and then you know, round out that whole thing. Um, and then of course, moving things out of base. Uh, so we started out the project with a very kitchen sink approach. Um, it would be good to have a sort of a, a much leaner core standard library. Um, with installed by default packages that provide a lot of the functionality that's currently in the base in, in the installation. So that you can choose not to have those at all and then and, and everything would be fine. Um, and of course, better documentation and tests. Um, okay, so ecosystem and tooling. We, the package manager needs yet another iteration. So there's been package one, package two, package three will be forthcoming. My uh, art is gonna talk about this later. Um, tomorrow, I believe. Um, it's a lightning talk. We're sort of rounding out the design phase of this. The sort of, the, the elevator pitch for it, it is, is that it's sort of a hybrid of virtual env and cargo. Um, so for the, for the dynamic parts, it's sort of virtual env-like, and for the, for the production deployments parts, it's sort of cargo-like. Um, testing infrastructure. Uh, uh, and that's just sort of like, the, I, I think the CI tools, like the stuff that Jarrett did with, uh, with performance testing, I'd like to see more stuff along those lines um, for, for testing correctness as well. Uh, the debugger, great talk about that by Keno yesterday. Juno, Mike gave a great demo of Juno doing debugging, so that needs to be brought to full maturity. Uh, ports to different platforms, and then I think we need to rationalize our whole parallel computing story. Um, Okay, so timeline, I'm gonna go a little over here, but key points, uh, 0.5 release candidate now-ish. Uh, so, you know, maybe this weekend or next week while everybody's here, we're very close. There's like a handful of issues. Uh, so 0.6 should be the last 0.x release. Um, 0.6 will essentially be 1.0 alpha, but I think we need a release to sort of like uh, first of all, allow deprecations to have one more cycle, and second of all, to sort of just let you know a few things settle in and be like, okay, well, that that we do need to fix, you know, this, this, and this. Um, but but that's essentially what the plan will be. Um, so we hope to have Julie, it ready by JuliaCon next year. Um, this is an ambitious timeline, but I think. You know, Yeah, this is important. We, we, we're we gonna do everything we can to make this happen. Um, so beyond 1.0, uh, I think we should not have two long release cycles. Um, so, you know, no like five years between Julia 1.0 and 2.0. I think that, uh, uh, you know, 2.0 a year or so after 1.0 is probably pretty reasonable. Um, the crucial thing here is that it, we must have a really solid upgrade path. And, I, and, and the, the language isn't going to like radically change. It's not going to be like Perl 5 versus Perl 6, where you're like, that's actually a new programming language. Um, <laughs> we, we know how we want to program Julia in general, and it's just features and, you know, you know 2.0 just means we might break a few things, whereas 1.x means your code should not break. Um, so we're very fo much following semantic versioning. Um, deprecations in Compat work pretty well. I think we could maybe do better with... Uh, program transformation and automated tools. Um, so that'll be part of the 1.0 to 2.0 release cycle. We'll be figuring out how to do this really well. Um, so that's it. Thank you.